What's up, Hulse? How are ya? Saturday night. It is after midnight, and we're here for our secret sermon. This is our weekly segment entitled Secret Teachings of Jesus. And if you are interested, you can go to my channel and find a whole playlist for Secret Teachings of Jesus. And we have about two years worth of um, adventures where on a weekly basis, we delve into the Gnostic Gospels. And I'm not a theologian or anything. This is just something that I was really interested in um, reading and studying for myself. And I didn't know when I would squeeze that into my life. So I thought that I would make it an episode that we would do together every week. So basically what I do is I come in from work, I'll open up, um, currently we're in the Gospel of Philip. Previously, we had done the secret book of James. Um, James is in Jesus's brother. I always think it's fascinating to try to imagine what it would be like to be James, the brother of Jesus. Like, why aren't there so many comedy movies about James, Jesus's brother? It just seems like such like low hanging fruit. But you know, that's just me. <laughs> I'm a weirdo, but yeah, so now we're, um, the gospel of James was sort of like, or the secret book of James was more like dialogue scene work with Jesus and the apostles. And the gospel of Philip has been more like these portions of text that are very cryptic, very symbolic and meant to be like a sort of a consciousness yoga that you kind of like meditate on. And mull over. So um, that gives you a little bit of the context of what we're doing and what we're reading. Um, yeah, and there are a million portions in the Gospel of Philip, and I felt compelled to continue to chip away at them. Uh, there are other Gospels I would like to read, but for now, we're here. We may take a break soon. I don't know. I just keep go going along, trucking along. Um, so we're in Nag Hammadi scriptures is where if you wanted to um, also get the, this collection of uh, Gnostics, you can get that in the Nag Hammadi scriptures. All right. Um, and then helpful notes about midnight. So there is a, a Kabbalistic idea that there are like every hour of the day has like an energetic signature and the seed level of the day is at midnight that's where it begins and so that's when the energy is at its most pure and potent so there's like this extra miraculous energy and protection um this time of day because it's the most positive hour of the day it's the beginning of the day um, but typically speaking, nighttime is a little bit more negative. Um, there's an absence of light at night and there are, you know, um, other energies that are active at night that aren't during the day, more negative energies. Um, so there's something called surrounding light and that is this protective light. Um, and so this is the light that's sort of pressing up against you to push you towards your growth edge. Our inner light is the light that we've already revealed in our life. This is the light that comes from our current level of joy and wisdom and compassion and acceptance and all of that thing, you know, all of that stuff for life. But the surrounding light, you know, that that can provide, you know, um, the, the inner light that radiates out that does provide protection. Um, but so does the surrounding light as well. Um, it's, you know, this light of our soul <clears throat> that uh, shrouds us. And so when we are um, asleep, our soul leaves our body and it actually makes us very vulnerable. Um, we are sort of having like a mini judgment day every night when we go to sleep. It's like a miniature death. Uh, and so there are ways to protect yourself while you sleep because you're more, more vulnerable um, at this time of night. Um, but the surrounding light of your merit like and, and your angels and things like protect you while you sleep. Well, there's something particularly potent about midnight because it's such a, um, a positive time of day. But it's also like this portal between the beginning of one thing and the end of another. So the veil is very thin at that time of night. So... 
there's like this extra ability to be able to make this direct connection with the light at that time and get deeper insights and maybe even make even deeper transformational change within yourself and being able to take the concepts and like ground them and, and embody them. But there's this spiritual protection around you when you study at this time of night that protects you from having to go through um, like a process of earning the knowledge um, that you are like the light that you're taking in. So like an again, example of this is if you've ever read like a spiritual book or a self-help book, it's almost like clockwork. Like the moment you sort of like start getting into the book and reading the table of contents, even it's like you're, you're automatically just challenged in that area. Like the phone will ring or the next time you leave the house, like something happens and it's like, Oh, okay. Well, we're in the book. We're in the material. We're already in the work. So that's what it is. It's like when you start to use your free will to participate in spiritual growth, spirit is then like, okay, great. We're in this. Um, okay, well here's the resistance so that you can grow spiritually. <laughs> well, you asked for it. This is great. We love your participation. We needed your free will. Um, yeah. So basically when you get, when you receive the light and when you learn about something, you have to go through a situation in life that helps you exercise that lesson. Um, there is a concept that we've talked about on this channel before called bread of shame. And so in the beginning, when the light was, you know, by itself, it wanted to share and express. And the moment that that consciousness became crystallized as an I am, that made way for the vessel so that the I am could share the light with the vessel. But then the vessel, like having the light sharing with it, it was like, oh, wow, this is great. I want to be just like the light. I want to share too, right? So I can't just continue to, to receive and receive and receive. I, I, I want to give too. And so the light was like, okay, I will take my light back and you will have to earn the light so that I don't create shame in you, guilt for receiving too much. See, what happens when we feel guilt or shame, um, we're not... In affinity with the light anymore we lose our resonance with the light that is not a an energy that vibrates with god shame and guilt is not right and that funny you know when you consider the culture around that right but god does not resonate with guilt and shame and so when, when that was that was what happened with adam and eve in the garden of eden you know and that in that sense the divine masculine divine feminine was separated from the divine when they felt the guilt and shame and tried to clothe themselves in the flesh, right? So light and vessel. If light gives to vessel without a process of learning and earning and embodying the lessons without earning the light, there is um, a phenomenon called bread of shame. And you have this like resentment, like you don't want it. It's like, oh, it's too much. And like you might have experienced this in your life. If someone is like over giving to you or there's no reason why you should be receiving all that they're like gushing over you. And you're like, this isn't, this is weird. Like, I don't want, you know, that's what that is. It's like bread of shame or like spoiled kids who end up very angry and resentful to their parents. And their parents are like, why don't you appreciate me? I've given you everything. It's like, this is, it's the result of bread of shame. You need to earn something to feel good about it and also to be able to resonate with it for real, to understand it for real, to be able to appreciate it, to be able to embody it, for it to be genuine. So having said all that, um, we if we start learning deep concepts, then we're going to attract opportunities for us to embody the lesson. And to an untrained eye, it's like people think like, oh, wow, you get involved in, you know, reading this stuff and then weird stuff starts happening. You get all in all this mysticism and then, you know, chaos. And it's like, well, the chaos is already happening, but this is planned chaos that's like, okay, now that we've rehearsed the play, let's see if you can execute it kind of thing. And so that is how we earn and that's how we actually elevate our soul and embody this this wisdom circling back at this time of night at midnight there's this added protection that if you're connecting with the light in holy scripture 
um, or in, in sacred text, it's like it provides this added protection where you don't have to go through a crazy chaotic process or at least not as much. It's like you get to um, charge on the credit card. It's like, a, it's like four no interest payments <laughs> instead of having interest on a credit card. Think of it that way. Okay, so um, tonight's portion is called God is a Man Eater. This is directly related to last week's episode. Um, if I can figure out how to specify when they have those little like suggested videos at the end, I'll try to attach this to last week's episode. But last week we read, where was it? Human beings and animals. And we talked about the four living kingdoms. And then I said, oh, you know what? This actually goes well with that verse and we'll do it next week. So this is next week and the verse is God is a man eater. So I, if I were you, I would definitely also watch human beings and animals because whatever we, whatever I don't talk about tonight, it's, there's probably a lot of related material in that other episode. Okay. So just remind me right now. I can see you through the TV, um, that we need to circle back and talk about the four living kingdoms. But first, let's read the verse. All right. I just wanted to show y'all too. Look, this is my little bookmark. I always use cards for bookmarks usually. And like sometimes they're playing cards. Sometimes they're tarot cards. It shows a couple of extra cards in the deck, I guess, for people like me who like to like use them as bookmarks. But I always like this picture. I would just think that it's, this is like the perfect picture that would go in like the Gnostic Gospels. It's like the person wearing the, the aluminum foil helmet kind of thing. I love it. I think it's so funny. Okay, back on task. God is a man-eater. He's a man eater. Whoa, here he comes. Here he comes. Watch out, boy. He'll chew you up. Okay, sorry. I'm really getting serious this time. Okay. God is a man eater. God is a man eater. And so humans are sacrificed to him. Before humans were sacrificed, animals were sacrificed. Because those to whom they were sacrificed were not gods. Okay, let's read that again. God is a man-eater, and so humans are sacrificed to him. Before humans were sacrificed, animals were sacrificed, because those to whom they were sacrificed were not gods. Okay, Just before we get into like the, the four living kingdoms, when it says, because those to whom they were sacrificed were not gods, there's a couple of things going on. So when people translate the Gnostic gospels, sometimes there are, um, I haven't gotten to these books yet, but there are books and translations or interpretations that are suggesting that there's like these different dimensions and realms um, that are greater realities called like mysteries and like there are beings called the archons and there's arguments that like there's like a demi like God in between the God that we think of as God that's like not as benign or so in a way this could be referencing those other God ruler beings um but sometimes also I feel like that's I uh, well I was going to say it's like almost too literal, but then there's so many, there's so much abstract like things that go on in the unmanifest and in the intrinsic realms and in the non-physical realms. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's part of like what it could mean 
like on the surface, like what they might be referencing. But also I think last week it was that we talked about how every time you read the Bible, you should be reading it on four levels. And there is a Hebrew word for orchard that I don't know, can't remember, can't recall. But I do know that each letter of the word orchard is the first letter of the word that represents the level of each of the four interpretations. And so one level is like surface level. It's just like, what are we talking about? Like, is this like, this is kind of like a moral that apply or like not even a moral that applies to life, but this is just like life lessons, like mundane, like, you know, whatnot. And then there is a deeper layer that is more like the emotional underlying, you know, theme. Like what's the moral of the story here? What's the heart level? And then there is the soul level. What is this speaking of symbolically that is speaking to our soul's transformation? And then there's like a deep spiritual level that literally is giving us like an encoded like technology for how the process works as we approach our soul's transformation. This is like the spiritual alchemy how to change the darkness into light kind of thing. So that's why I think that I pointed out the end of that portion of because those to whom they were sacrificed were not gods. Because on one level, it could be making a reference to God versus like other beings that were more like demigods. Uh, but then there's also what I think is pointing out that because we as human beings are made in the image of God, we are both human and divine. But it takes our participation and our free will to transcend our animalistic base instincts and become our full human self, our fullness and humanity where we have the animal instinct, the the human consciousness and then above that like an even greater divine super consciousness that we tap into that transcends our human ego and that, that is the enlightened state where we are one with our higher self and that higher self is like as closest with the affinity of the light like a version of like God coming in and, and being represented as like and manifest as you, like God experiencing life as you, that's like your higher self is like on the level of like a Christ consciousness level connected directly with divine. So in a way we have the, the potential to be God like, um, we have that in our DNA and in our being but it takes our ability to come back lifetime after lifetime and try to go through tikkun correction, which is our soul elevation, where we transcend our lower aspects, the lower animalistic um, base instincts, our reactivity, our, our lack of self-mastery, our lack of self-control, our lack of sovereignty. We become sovereign so that we can finally actually exercise our free will. Otherwise, we're really just going through life on autopilot and we're going through life in a state of animal consciousness and we are reacting in survival mode and in trauma response and in hunger and in craving and in, you know, all of those sort of unrefined primal base instincts, right? And so that's where the ego like plays havoc. Um, it's like when those things are enticed and in the, uh, enlivened and triggered, it's like the ego is like, oh, great. Wow. Now that you feel out of control, like you need to survive and your survival instincts are coming into the picture. Now, I, now I've got real control over you. Now I can drive you in any direction because I'm going to use it as an excuse to like keep us safe, right? Keep us all safe. We're all, we're all like, you know, panicked right now. You know, we're, I, I've got it all under control, right? Ego's got it under control. 
So our, you know, our mission in this life as a soul, you know, transcending towards spirit is that we want to ascend beyond those, ba those, those base instincts so that we have self-control so that we can pause and we're not in reactive reactivity. We're not in reactive consciousness. We're not in effect consciousness. We choose with our free will and our consciousness and our awakened awareness. I want to be like the light, the light of the creator. The light of the creator is the cause of all. The light of the creator is never affected. It never changes. It never fluctuates. It's eternal. It's unwavering. It's unfluctuating. So in order to be like that, we can't be affected by when the wind blows, when we're startled, when we're jumpy. We have to be stable, steady, right? And that's what gives us our power in any given situation. It connects us to the power of the light. It makes us um, it attunes us as channels so we can channel that through because we're in resonance with it. That's when you're in the zone, right? That's when you're in like manifestation zone. Oh, velvet rope is open. Please right this way. Upgrade here. There's a parking spot. Opportunity, you know, joy, fulfillment, things going well, you know, just like surprises and miracles unfolding everywhere, right? The more you have affinity with the light, the more you're in certainty, the more that your vibration is the most stable and steady in your environment, you're going to be in the most influence because everything else is in flux all the time. Oh, oh, I'm offended. Oh, I'm so scared. Oh, I'm so anxious. Oh, I'm horny. I'm starving. I'm depressed. I'm annoyed. I'm impatient. I'm, oh, I had one moment of peace. Oh, it's ruined now. I've been distracted by something. Oh, I'm covetous. I'm envious. I can't stand this person. That's so annoying. Why are they playing that? That song is in my head, right? So our aim is to be able to not be affected by all of this and to have start growing self-mastery and self-control. Have you ever, guys ever thought about the fruits of the spirit? One of them is self-control. And I, 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 you know, would argue that you can't really have any of the other ones, not on a consistent basis, if you don't have self-control. So the more consistent and solid you are, it's like you're the one with the clear signal that the radio signal can tune into, right? Otherwise, it's like, oh, oh, you're breaking in and out. I can't connect. I can't connect, right? The universe needs something to connect to, to send you the thing in just to put you on a path or whatever, right? So the more conscious we become and the more cause consciousness we become, then we start to elevate higher in our both humanity and our divinity. And we should never reject our humanity because it's our ability to fall in the first place that gives us the ability to awaken, to see anything, to have the material to work with in order to transcend. It's the falling that gives us the, the raw material, the, the clay to work with. So having said all that, let's, let's take another loop around this again. God is a man eater. And so humans are sacrificed to him. Before humans were sacrificed, animals were sacrificed. Because those to whom they were sacrificed were not gods. Now, we'll talk about eating in a minute. But first, before I forget, I wanted to say that while we're on the topic of ascending and transcending our soul... As we ascend in consciousness, and as we shed the layers of ego over lifetimes and lifetimes, we rise in consciousness. And the less personality we have, the more we become more like the light, the less identity of self that we have. It's like literally the self is dissolving and eventually we get reabsorbed back into the light, right? Back into the all and we're reabsorbed into the one. So in that way, God is a man eater. Eventually the universe 
is expanding to the point that it's just going to spread out into nothing. It's just into like particles of light that then fade into reabsorption, into just everything being all in one again. It's like the, the singularity spread out again. And then it's like divine has to condense condense to condense once more into that singularity that then boom big bang right so that happens also to us it's like on on all the levels it's like in a scientific level like on a, in a material way like the universe is expanding into disillusion right god is just absorbing it's god is a man eater um, on a consciousness level, the more elevated we become, the more awakened and enlightened we become, the less of our personality that we have. After so many lifetimes of elevating the soul, once we get to a certain point, there's nothing to come back. We have no more density. We can't materialize anymore. We're, we've been reabsorbed. We don't have a personality. Um, there was something so interesting. Uh, there's this documentary called... DMT, the spiritual molecule. And this particular documentary was about a study done with DMT in a medical environment so that it was liquid injections to into the, the bloodstream of DMT. And it was like a, a you know, a, a study done in a controlled environment. It's all legal. Um, they had three um, adult participants, or at least these ones that were in the uh, the documentary. And one of the men, and these weren't like drug addicts people. These weren't even people like me. They would be like, yeah, I want to go do it. Yeah. It was like very sober, you know, very, like one guy was like a shaman. And this is the one that I'm going to reference. But he was talking about like when he broke through. And so sorry, if you don't know about DMT. DMT is the chemical that your brain releases when you die. And it really, it's, it's in charge of a lot of other things. I think, you know, probably has a lot to do with our visualization and our imagination and things. Uh, but there's something miraculous um, about this particular molecule in the, in the, in the DNA. And so when people do this, um, they can take it from, I, I think, is it ayahuasca? Uh, I believe there's, there's DMT and ayahuasca tea and there's different ways you can take it. Um, but essentially it sends you on like the trip of a lifetime and it's not like hallucinating. You're like out of body and you are in like the other realms. And so this one man, he was like, I kept ascending so far that he was like as I was leaving my body he goes I could feel every layer of me leaving and he was like at first it was like the people that I loved and cared about like they left and like then like it was just like all the parts of this man's personality were melting away as he was becoming like going deeper into the outer realms the outer space but like the the unmanifest and as he was getting closer to being absorbed into like the all he was like, it was scary to him. Cause he was like, Oh my God, like, I don't want to leave my humanity behind. Like he could feel himself leaving behind the soul, the body, the, the connection to the body. And he was becoming totally spirit. And he was like, Oh, Oh, I don't want to, I don't want to lose myself. He was getting almost absorbed. Like I think maybe Enoch, right? In the, in the Old Testament, Enoch was so, like, such a deep prophet, and he was so connected with God. E Enoch walked with God all his days, and then one day he wasn't anymore, or one, one day he was not. And it was like he was absorbed, right? So God is a man-eater. Um, God depicting, God depicted as Saturn. Saturn is a man, um, I think, eating his children is what is usually the way that um, Saturn is painted in classical paintings. So God is a man eater. God is a man eater. And so humans are sacrificed to him. And so as our souls process, our purpose here is to, it's like we are God's consciousness being projected into a realm so that God can participate and experience other 
through the self because there wasn't anything but God at first. So God had to peel off pieces of God in order to have other, right, to share with, to have vessel. So in the beginning, it was like God was in a unified whole and oneness and then became separate to experience vessel. And then vessel had to go through a process of forgetting who vessel was in order to return back to vessel and reconnect in unity again. And so the more the vessel has affinity with the light, the less shells the vessel has, right? So we get reabsorbed back into the all. God is a man eater. God is a man eater. Oh, here he comes, here he comes. Watch out, boy, he'll chew you up. <laughs> God's a man eater. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, so God is a man eater, and so humans are sacrificed to him. Before humans were sacrificed, animals were sacrificed. Because those to whom they were sacrificed were not gods. Okay, so back to eating and the four living kingdoms. In this material existence, there are four living kingdoms that we interact with here on planet Earth as mankind. There is the mineral kingdom. This is the inanimate kingdom. Uh, this kingdom is alive and it does have consciousness and there is a purpose to the mineral kingdom. But the mineral kingdom has the lowest level of desire and so it moves the least. So this, while it is alive and it does have consciousness, it is the lowest level of consciousness. And so the, the next living kingdom is called the plant kingdom or the vegetative kingdom. And so this kingdom is slightly more complex than the mineral kingdom. This kingdom has consciousness. This kingdom actually does move ever so slightly, very slowly on its own, and has slightly more desire. So what happens is the mineral kingdom is sacrificed for the sake of the higher kingdom, the, min the plant kingdom, the vegetative kingdom. So in that happening, the vegetable kingdom absorbs the mineral kingdom. And then in that absorption, because the mineral kingdom has supported the life and nurturing and perpetuation of the, the vegetable kingdom, the mineral kingdom has then been elevated on a spiritual level because of that, because of their sacrifice. They have been elevated and lifted up. They have become absorbed by the plant kingdom. And then they are now part of a higher more elevated uh, I can't think of the word I want but more elevated kingdom okay so the next kingdom we have the mineral kingdom and then the plant kingdom has absorbed the mineral kingdom and the mineral kingdom sacrificed itself for the animal the the material kingdom or sorry the vegetable kingdom and so then the because of that the mineral kingdom was Ascended, transcended, elevated, brought up. Can't think of the word, tired. So now we have the vegetable kingdom with its consciousness more than the mineral kingdom, but less than the animal kingdom. The animal kingdom has more consciousness. The animal kingdom, um, you know, the vegetable kingdom does have intelligence and it does communicate. Trees and all kinds of uh, flora and fauna communicate through mitochondria. I think is the word, but this is like, um, like a fungal system through their roots and they, trees telepathically communicate. They can send one another things that they need. Other plants, they, they speak, they have a whole language, but it's just not as, it's not the same as ours. It doesn't have the same affinity with the light, albeit it is complex and intricate and very fascinating. Fast forward to animals. Animals have a more developed 
personality. I don't want to say that they're more intelligent than plants, but they might be. They're more complex in their intelligence. Uh, they have more dimension, right? Animals have personality. They play, you know, they have different kind of attitudes. Like they're not all the same. And I, I, I've learned recently that maybe plants aren't all the same either. They have different personalities as well. It's subtle, subtle differences. So, you know, animals are affectionate with one another. You know, they, they don't have a soul that has like a tikkun process that they go to through. But people can come back and be reincarnated as animals as part of their correction process. And so they're on a different level, though, animals. Um, they don't have the same level of spirit. They don't have that divinity, that sovereignty that we do. They don't have the same free will. And, um, and affinity with the light of the creator. They're a lower being. And so animals are, you know, they, the vegetable kingdom are sacrificed to animals. So then the animals absorb the vegetables and the vegetables give themselves in sacrifice for the sake of nurturing the higher kingdom above them. And then they are absorbed and they are elevated because of that. So the animal kingdom has more desire also than the vegetable kingdom or the mineral kingdom. So they move more, right? They, they're in motion. They are locomotive beings. So then we get to the, you'd think it's going to be human kingdom. It's not what it's called. It's called the speaking kingdom. We are the speaking kingdom. And that gives us the most affinity with the light. The fact that we can speak our thoughts and our consciousness makes us, gives us affinity with the creator. Because the first thing that the creator did was let there be light. There was a, an audible sound made, which was described as speech. And so what gives us affinity with the light of the creator is that we can speak our thoughts we can take a thought and bring it from nothing and make it into something. Our thoughts, I'm sorry, our words are very powerful. We have the power of life and death in our tongue. Our words are like spells all the time. There are orders out into the universe. So we need to be really careful and intentional about the kinds of words that we're using and choosing and what we say, what we speak about ourselves. Um, I'm very conscious now about what I will attach to I am or I'm, right? It's like you don't want to speak that on yourself or maybe you do, depending on what you're saying. So the, the human kingdom has a higher consciousness. We have affinity with the light of the creator. In fact, if we can transcend our own animal-based instincts, we can have a more of a divine level of consciousness. And we can be, you know, divine beings, just like Christ. So, but it takes our participation. It takes us overcoming our reactivity, you know, healing our ego, overcoming those animal-based instincts. But because we are a more elevated um, being, the animals are sacrificed to us and we absorb the animals, lifting and elevating the animals, right? But we are not yet gods. We are, we have div divine potential within us, but we aren't gods yet. And we are especially aren't gods when we are just above animal level of consciousness. It takes our active free will choice to go through the process of ascension, of ascending our consciousness, of awakening, right? Of, of, um, awakening to revelation and then actually allowing that transformation to take root, to elevate our soul and then to elevate us on the outside of, of like how we participate in life. Are we in effect consciousness? Are we responding to life or are we proactively the cause in our life? Are we maintaining that consciousness? Are we living on purpose with intention? Are we able to pause in a moment and take our time and choose what we say and what we do and where we go. God is a man-eater. 
And so humans are sacrificed to him. Before humans were sacrificed, animals were sacrificed. Because those to whom they were sacrificed were not gods. And so in this material world, the way that we sacrifice the, king, the living kingdoms is through absorption. We kill and eat them. The way that God eats man, the way that God man is sacrificed to God and the way that God absorbs man is through our spirituality, through dying to our soul, through dying to our ego and allowing those parts to fall away and for God to absorb those parts of us and for us to be reabsorbed and transcended, right? And when God eats those layers of ego, our soul that's dying, it helps us elevate just like the other living kingdoms elevate through our absorption. Interesting though. Kind of crazy. So God is a man eater. And so humans are sacrificed to him. Before humans were sacrificed, animals were sacrificed. Because those to whom they were sacrificed were not gods. And so, you know, it's funny when... We end up playing out literally what is true on a spiritual level. It's like a symbol on the intrinsic realm that ends up being projected outward in a literal way. So whilst on a human level to God, we're being sacrificed in a metaphysical sense, in an esoteric sense, um, in an existential sense, we, the material realm beings, express this in a material way, in an active, outer, physical way. Like, we are physical beings in a physical world, and we are in a material world to be here to take material action. But what we need to realize is that the deeper truth and reality and the, the realist reality is that on the spiritual level first, on the energy realm, because that's ultimately what's being projected out. It's like, we're like, no, we're the screen, we're the movie. But like, it's like, you're just, we're just the screen. The, the projection is coming through the light that's going through the, the negative, the film. And then the picture is being projected onto the screen. But we in the material realm are like, no, it's all about the screen. The people are in the screen. It's like, no, it's not, it's not really the screen. The, this can change. We can take out the, ch the whole movie can change at any moment. Like it's really like we're, the light is projecting through the scenario. And, and you know, it, that's the real thing. The screen can be swapped out. We can go to a different theater, right? The light and the, the context is the reality, not the actual screen. The vessels everywhere, the physical vessels, the sleeves that we're all in, this isn't, these are all, everything you see around you is a vessel. Every pursuit that we have is a vessel. Every goal that we have is a vessel. All the physical parts of us, we ourselves are a vessel. Um, it's not about the vessel. The vessel is just a sleeve that can be swipped, swapped in and out, right? I, when I put this book down, I can go get another one, right? This is my body in this lifetime. This is my personality. This is who I am. But there's a possibility that in other lifetimes, I have been other personalities. Um, vessels in life, they come and go. Um, what's When I take off this flesh suit, though... I have the soul that follows me lifetime after lifetime, the spirit, the personality, all of it, all the experience, all the memories, all of the healing, all of the changing and the transformation and the, the changing of my lower self to my higher self through every lifetime. It stays. It follows me. I am. I get to keep that until it's completely reabsorbed. So... So yeah, so uh, oh my gosh, so tired and this material is so thick. So let's read this one more time for the cheap seats in the back because I think we're done and we're at 44 minutes. God is a man-eater and so humans are sacrificed to him. 
Before humans were sacrificed, animals were sacrificed because those to whom they were sacrificed were not gods. All right, y'all, it's a cool 45 minutes. We're at the end of our episode. Now, ciao, I'll see y'all tomorrow for our weekly energy oracle forecast. All right, bye.